going on all my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. What is the one thing that comprises our bodies of between 60 to 70 percent? Well, that's fluid. So today we're going to be discussing fluid compartments and balance. So when we talk about fluid, we really need to understand where fluid is and how it navigates throughout our body. So as I discussed before, our body is made up of 60 to 70 percent fluid. So where is all of that fluid located? Well, we have two main categories. It's either intracellularly or extracellularly. So when it comes to our intracellular fluid, or ICF, that's the fluid that's found within our cells or inside of our cells. So 70% of our body fluid is located inside the cells, specifically our skeletal muscle cells. When it comes to our extracellular fluid, or ECF, that's the fluid that's going to be found on the outside of our cells. And that makes up approximately 30% of our body fluid. So that can be our blood, connective tissue, our bone, lymph, and even spinal cord fluid, such as CSF. That ECF can be broken down even further. So we have our intravascular fluid and our interstitial fluid. So our intravascular fluid is that fluid that's located in the blood vessel outside of our cells. And that's approximately six liters of blood inside of our blood vessels. Interstitial fluid is the remaining fluid that is located within the tissues, but still outside of our cells. And that makes up between 11 to 12 liters of interstitial fluid. So now that we know where fluid belongs, sometimes our fluid isn't where it's supposed to be. So as you go through clinicals, nursing school, NCLEX, and you become a nurse, you're going to hear a lot of different phrases, such as third spacing and edema. So let's break down what these mean. So third spacing is the accumulation of trapped extracellular fluid in an actual or potential body space as a result of disease or injury. So we have many different body spaces. This can include pericardial, that's around our heart, pleural, that's around our lungs, peritoneal, that's inside the walls of our abdomen and our pelvis, or even our joint cavities. We have the bowels, the abdomen, or even within soft tissues after trauma or burns. So trapped fluid is a volume loss and it is unavailable to the body for normal physiological process, right? It's not where it's supposed to be, so we can't use it. Assessments of third spacing is difficult as the loss may not be reflected in weight changes or intake and output records. So you may not be apparent unless we start to have organ malfunction occurring within our patients. So now that we know what third spacing is, then what is edema? How are they different? So edema is the excess accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space, and it occurs as a result of alterations in oncotic pressure, hydrostatic pressure, capillary permeability, and lymphatic obstruction. So it's very different from our third spacing. So localized edema occurs as a result of traumatic injuries such as accidents, surgeries, and then of course local inflammatory processes or burns. Whereas when we have generalized edema, it's an excessive accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space throughout the body and occurs as a result of conditions related to either cardiac, renal, or even liver failure. So what factors are going to influence fluid balance? Well, we have our muscle, our body fat, and our gender. So to begin, muscle retains more fluid. It wants to keep that fluid. We need that muscle, we need that fluid, baby. So skin and blood hold the highest amount of water. When it comes to body fat, fat resists fluid. No, I don't need that. I'm fat. I'm good. I don't need all of that fluid. So with our obese individuals, you're going to have less fluid than our thinner individuals. Now, I know a lot of people are like, that doesn't make any sense. I thought if they were obese, they had more fluid. But no, it's not because that fat repels that fluid, they're going to have significantly less fluid than someone that's, say, thinner and doesn't have as much fat. When it comes to gender, men usually retain fluid more than women do to, to muscle mass. So as you know, men, um, depending on their genetics and being a man, they have a lot more muscle mass than women do. So they're going to retain more fluid. I'm not, and listen, ladies, I get it. 
we bloat, we get our periods, it's gross, it's disgusting, and we're like, there's no way that they retain more fluid than us, but trust me, based on that muscle mass, we know that muscle wants to retain more fluid. The more muscle mass they have, the more fluid they retain. So how does our fluid remain balanced? Well, fluid needs to be where it belongs, right? In order to maintain that, they have to have the same concentration where they are in order to maintain balance. So fluid in each body compartment contains electrolytes. Electrolytes, also known as cations, there are positive electrolytes or ions. So electrolytes are ions that are found in our body fluid. They help conduct electricity, energy, help control body fluids, and they also maintain homeostasis in the body. So I wanted to help you, especially when it comes to understanding your NCLEX and your nursing school exams, is where our electrolytes are located based on their normal range. So this is your electrolytes, locations, quick tips, make sure that you write this down. So the lower the normal range, the electrolyte is found predominantly inside the cell. That makes sense, right? So when we draw our labs, we're looking at serum electrolytes. If it's not located in the serum, then it's located inside of the cell. So the lower the normal range, we know that it's predominantly inside the cell. In, um, with our other electrolytes, the higher the normal range, so the higher it is found in the serum that we are pulling from our patients, we know the electrolyte is found predominantly outside of the cell. So the lower the range, it's more inside the cell. The higher the range, it's more outside the cell. So let's take a look at these examples. So potassium is largely found inside of the cell. It's our intracellular cation. So the normal range is extremely low, right? Normal range is 3.5 to 5. So that lets us know that when we're pulling serum potassium levels, we're going to have lower numbers because this is primarily an intracellular cation. Whereas with sodium, we have a significantly higher normal range, 135 to 145. That's huge, right? So we know that this electrolyte belongs outside of the cell. So we're going to have more serum sodium than we are going to have serum potassium because of those ranges. 3.5 to 5 is low. It's going to be found inside the cell. 135 to 145 is much higher, so we know it's going to be found outside of the cell. I hope that was a little bit helpful in understanding where these electrolytes live and how they play a role in our serum balance. So what separates these fluid spaces? As you know, fluid spaces are separated by semi-permeable membranes. This allows certain particles and liquids to move through the membrane, either through osmosis or diffusion. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in our next video. So the cell membrane is what surrounds the cytoplasm of the cell. Our vessel wall is a single layer of endothelial cells between the blood and the smooth muscle. We have our tissue membrane as a thin layer or sheet of cells that covers the outside of our body, such as our skin, our organs, such as like our pericardium that surrounds our heart, internal passes, passageways that open to the exterior body, such as the mucosa of our stomach, and the lining of movable joint cavities. And lastly, we have our organ walls. That's the structural layer that's surrounding our organs. So let's look at how fluids are lost and gained. So we know that fluid losses are widely influenced by our organs. So let's begin by looking at our kidneys. Now our kidneys are like the washing machines of our body. They really wash out all of our fluids. So our daily urine output that we expect to see is between one to two liters. A more accurate output by the kidneys is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram Per hour. And this is never more important than when we're looking at different disease processes such as sepsis. So in sepsis, we're having major shifting of fluid in areas that it doesn't belong. And one of the key organs that take a hit in early sepsis are our kidneys. So we start to see a decrease in urinary outputs. And that's why it's so important that you monitor those intake and outputs because that being one of our first key indicators in sepsis will help us catch something way before any lab is going to catch um, 
any kind of disease processes. So blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine are usually monitored every 24 hours. And because it's every 24 hours, this can significantly delay diagnosis. So we really have to watch our patient's kidney functions so that we can catch these complications from occurring early. Something that's important to note when you're looking at your labs, if both your BUN and creatinine are high, then that's a key indicator that we're having some kind of renal failure, whether it be acute or chronic. When our BUN is just high alone and our creatinine is fine, we're looking at more of a dehydration issue. So that's really important to know, especially when you're taking your NCLEX. If our BUN and our creatinine are elevated, we're looking at renal failure. And if our BUN is high alone, we're looking at more of like a dehydration issue. Um, the kidneys cannot excrete appropriately, so toxins will begin to build up in our system, like we see with sepsis, um, causing more complications. Next, we have our skin. So we have two different kinds of losses. We have sensible losses and insensible losses, like we see with our lungs. So with sensible losses, these are losses that can be perceived or sensed. They can be measured. You've lost it, you know you've lost it. So when it comes to sensible losses with our skin, one of the big things that you think about is sweating, right? Those are visible fluid losses through our skin. Inside that sweat, we have sodium, chloride, and potassium are the biggest electrolytes that are lost. Losses increase during fever, thyroid crisis, as well as heat stroke. So each, something that's again, really important to note when you're taking your NCLEX is that with each body degree increase, we increase fluid losses by 10%. So if you have a patient that's normally 98.6 and now they're 99.6, we've just lost 10% of our fluid loss. That's insane, right? That's a lot of fluid loss. So you can imagine if we, if we go up five degrees, we're losing 50% fluid loss. That can be massively detrimental to our patients. Burns is another one when it comes to our skin. Most, they are most at risk for that fluid volume deficit due to that third spacing that we discussed earlier through that blistering of the skin. So it's very important to watch them as well. Moving on to our lungs. We talked about our insensible losses. So this can either be per perceived or measured directly. So you've lost it, but you really don't know you've lost it because it's insensible. You just don't know. So ins insensible losses are lost through respiratory alkalosis caused by hyperventilation. That's one of the ways that it can be lost. An example of that can be Kuzmal's respirations that you see with a lot of our DKA patients. So again, sensible losses or losses that we can perceive and can measure. We, um, we've lost it and we know we've lost it and insensible losses cannot be perceived or measured directly. So we've lost it, but we don't know we've lost it. So that's something really important to know between those two um, different kinds of losses. And lastly, we have our GI tract. So diarrhea and fistulas cause the largest fluid volume losses when it comes to our GI tract. So who is most at risk for fluid imbalances? So we have our elderly population, those with tissue trauma and wound drainage, as well as those receiving diuretics. So beginning with our elderly population, they're at risk for two things. They're either going to be fluid overloaded or they're gonna be dehydrated. So as we know, as we get older, our elderly population starts to develop things such as heart failure or congestive heart failure, CHF, as well as renal failure, failure of our kidneys. And because we are unable to excrete all of that fluid volume, we are at risk of fluid overload with our elderly patients. Whereas they can also be at risk for dehydration. They can go completely on the other end of the spectrum because why? They become forgetful as they get older. That forgetfulness will lead to them not drinking water, not taking their medications, so they will be at high risk for developing dehydration. When it comes to tissue trauma and wound drainage, we know that extensive tissue injury may occur with trauma or burns, causing initially hyperkalemia and then eventually leading to hypokalemia and hyponatremia um, with these patients. Burns cause major fluid volume deficits due to third spacing. It's a trauma, remember third spacing is more related to trauma. So again, burns, major fluid volume deficits. It's gonna be in areas that it shouldn't be. You're gonna see those big blisters on their skin. It's gonna be accumulated with fluid. Lastly, diuretics. So to help the body excrete fluid in the presence of high blood pressure, 
heart failure, liver failure, and kidney failure, you're going to see patients on diuretics and that can massively affect fluid imbalances within our patients. I hope that this video was helpful for you in passing your nursing exams like a boss. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Make sure that you follow me on my social media, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe as well as like this video. I also have a website at www.nursechung.com where I will have NCLEX style questions as well as additional resources with each of my videos. So make sure that you check that out. But until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I will speak with you all again soon. Bye.